Honored guests, our program is about to begin. Please welcome the 17th president of the George Washington University, Dr. Thomas J. LeBlanc. Hello, GW. Thank you for joining us today. I'm delighted to welcome you to the first discussion this fall in our Presidential Distinguished Event Series. We launched this series to provide more ways for you to hear from renowned leaders, the individuals who bring illuminating dialogue, insight, and inspiration to our GW community. This year, in our virtual environment, we've been able to extend the reach of these events even more, and we hope to host these opportunities often over the coming months. For many in our community, this will be the first of countless only at GW experiences to come. Our GW community is fortunate to hear directly from the leaders, doers, and thinkers who make many of the decisions that affect us each day. But our students, faculty, staff, and alumni aren't just passive listeners in these events. You're leading the discussions and actively creating solutions. And you're leveraging this university's teaching and research mission to drive positive change in the world. Today, on Constitution Day, we're honored to host U.S. Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer for a conversation with our GW community. Our Constitution and its interpretation by our justices has far-reaching implications. It affects us in big and small ways, as individuals, as citizens of this nation, and as citizens of the world. Today, we'll gain new insight into these implications and we'll get a look inside one of our nation's top legal minds. Justice Breyer is joined in discussion by our very own GW Law Dean, Dana Bowen Matthew, and Associate Dean, Alan Morrison. And I especially want to thank them both for their leadership to GW and for their help in making this event possible. Dean Matthew is a visionary and strategic leader of GW Law, and she joined our community this year. She is a nationally recognized lawyer and legal scholar with three decades of industry and academic experience. She is an expert in health equity and public health policy, and she is driven by a passion for public service. Associate Dean Morrison is the Lerner Family Associate Dean for Public Interest and Public Service at GW Law. He is responsible for creating pro bono opportunities for students, bringing a wide range of public interest programs to GW Law, and encouraging students to seek positions in the nonprofit and government sectors. I am now pleased to turn our program over to Associate Dean Morrison. Thank you, President LeBlanc. And it's my great privilege and honor to welcome Associate Justice Stephen Breyer, who is about to start his 27th term on the Supreme Court. While Justice Breyer is often in dissent, he's in fact in the majority in one respect and always. And that is the majority of the justices are now former law clerks, with Justice Breyer having clerked for Justice Goldberg, uh, followed by Chief Justice Rehnquist, and the three most recent ap appointees, uh, Justice Kagan, Justice Gorsuch, and Justice Kavanaugh, all of whom clerked on the Supreme Court. Following his term on the Supreme Court, uh, Justice Breyer worked for the Antitrust Division of the Justice Department. He was a law professor at Harvard, Assistant Watergate Special Prosecutor, and Chief Counsel for the Senate Judiciary Committee. From that position, he went on the First Circuit, where he served for 14 years. Uh, in addition to his service there, he was an original member of the United States Sentencing Commission, and he became the chief judge of the First Circuit. Uh, and that position, he was responsible for building the magnificent First Circuit Courthouse in, in Boston. Uh, that leads me to one of two lesser known facts about the justice that are not in his biography. Uh, the first of these is that he is one of the seven members of the jury for the annual Pritzker Architecture Prize often referred to as the Nobel Prize for Architecture. Not surprisingly, he's the only lawyer on that panel. The second unknown fact about him, or lesser known fact, is that he is fluent in French. He regularly lectures, he speaks, and he writes in French. In fact, this summer, he was preparing to give a speech in, in Paris, all in French, which he'd written out. But alas, as Ingrid Bergman said in Casablanca, we'll always have Paris, but just not this year. I want to talk about now my favorite opinion of the justices. This is not a great constitutional opinion in, in what normally uh, people think that. Uh, it is whole women's health against Hellerstadt. 
In that case, the state of Texas imposed very stringent requirements on clinics that were used to perform abortion services. Um, the justice concluded that that was unconstitutional, not through grand constitutional doctrine, but by a methodical digging through the record where he established that there were two major flaws. First, that the serious barriers prevented women from actually obtaining their constitutional right to abortion. And second, that the requirements for admitting privileges at hospitals within 30 miles of the clinic were wholly irrelevant to the health of, of, of the women. Uh, Justice Breyer uh, had the good sense not to say what many of us who read the opinion thought, that the only reason that Texas imposed these requirements was because it didn't want anybody to get abortions, and this was the best way it found to do that. Uh, speaking of health, uh, Justice Breyer, all of us want to know, how are you feeling today? Absolutely fine. <laughs> Thank you. And as they can tell, Alan, we've been friends for years and years and years and years. So uh, he's dug yeah. up. Uh, Dean Morrison, uh, all of these uh, facts about it. Well, I am Dean. interested in health also. May I ask a question about health as well? Please, Dean. Well, because and thank of the you pandemic, for inviting me here. <laughs> I say thank welcome. you for inviting me. We're so glad to have you. Well, because of the pandemic, there are many constitutional issues being played out in front of us on the streets, on the televisions, in the news. And so in many ways, constitutionalism is a part of our debate and conversation every day. And so I want to ask you your view uh, about the Constitution and our democracy. One of my favorite of your books uh, is about making democracy work, a judge's view. And in this public health crisis, many are asking, does our democracy work? Can our democracy work? What must we do to make our democracy work? What is your view about what we must do these days to make our democracy work? Well, on the first part, the Constitution, uh, one of the privileges, and it is perhaps the biggest privilege of, of my own job now, is I see in front of me every single day uh, citizens of this country, and some who aren't, but they're every race, every religion, every point of view imaginable. And believe me, my mother used to say, there's no view so crazy that there isn't somebody who doesn't hold it in America. But they're all different points of view, uh, every national origin, and they have decided to uh, resolve their differences under law. And when I talk to some of the students about decisions they don't like, and they say, well, maybe that's too bad. I say, turn on the television set. Turn on the television set and see how people in a few other countries decide their differences. So that document, the Constitution, here, I'm just reaching for it over here on my desk. You see, there it is. And uh, uh, that helps bring these people together in court and get our differences resolved. So, of course, this is important. And, and the courts, by the way, just like the document, have had their ups and downs. It's not 100% plus. But on balance, it is a pretty good way to resolve all the differences we might have. And what can the students do? Same as everybody. And I think the most important thing they can do, and it's not so easy, participate. You don't like what's going on? Get out there and try to change it. How? You think about it. You convince people. You get allies. And by the way, I usually say uh, to the graduating classes, I can't tell you what to do with your life, but I hope, I hope that you will spend some time participating in public life. That can be on a library board. It can be on a jury. It can be on a, uh, a school board. There are a thousand ways of doing it. But do it. And all I can tell you is after working with the document is the people who wrote this thought, if you do not participate, this won't work. And I, what I really have come to believe, that's absolutely true. So, you'll so stop complaining and start convincing. And that's the, that's the uh, 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 what are you doing about it? So th that would be my 
thought about what's the most important thing I can do. That's great. Justice Breyer, I saw yesterday that the court announced that the October cases will be heard only by phone as they did last May. Uh, how do you think those oral arguments went? Were, were, uh, with, did the strict rotation help or hurt the process? Did the time limits prevent the justices from asking follow-up questions? Uh, what do you think about that whole thing? I think there's a plus and there's a minus. And what, what we do is we go in order and we each have two minutes to ask questions and then we'll go back and uh, if that time isn't used up, we'll go back a whole time and then we'll ask some more. Uh, and what this machine does that we're working on now uh, and what the internet does and what all these do is it makes you listen. You have to listen more closely. I mean, the technical system is fine, but the it's good. But you still have to listen to what the others are saying. And so I thought that was a plus because everybody hears what everybody else is saying and what the answers are and they pay close attention. Now there is a minus. The minus, and I sometimes think, well, it's less fun. But if it's less fun, why? Well, you don't necessarily have as much dialogue. You can't get the dialogue. I like it very much to listen to what my colleagues are saying, and then sometimes you uh, there's some back and forth among us, and that makes some progress. And it really makes progress, as you know, uh, Alan, because you're a you know good trial lawyer. Uh, you very occasionally. But sometimes you get a situation where the judge and the lawyer are on the same wavelength, they don't necessarily agree, but they're having a practical conversation about what actually they believe, not just the client. What do you think this will do if we decide this way to bankruptcy law? And that lawyer knows more about it than I do, bankruptcy law. And you'll get some back and forth. That's why Learned Hand, who was a great judge, had all the seats of the judges at the same eye level as the lawyers who were speaking to them. Because he wants to get that contact. And he wants to get that conversation going. So, like most things, there are pluses and there are minuses. Uh, I, I like it, but I'm not sure I'd like to do it all the time. And are, are your weekly conferences among the justices, are those entirely audio or do you have uh, visual like we have here today? No, they're, they're, they're audio. The, the reason that they're audio is just technical. So, I mean, the reason that it really is telephone is because they're, 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 with most of these, we're told by the technical people that there can be security problems. And it isn't even so much what we say. It's if somebody decided to be disruptive uh, from the outside or the hackers or whatever, and you don't know what would happen. And, and I think that's what's led us to be pretty cautious. Dean Matthew. Justice Breyer, I would like to ask you about one of my favorite sections of the Constitution. And I, like you, I keep my Constitution very close by. So here's my little copy. And I, I'm going to turn to one of my favorite, if I'm allowed to say that, that I have a favorite. Uh, it's my area of scholarly specialty, and it's the 14th Amendment. I want to ask you about that for a number of reasons. Today's Constitution Day, but I've heard it also called Constitution and Citizens Day. Um, and I wonder, uh, because you write so often about different parts of the 14th Amendment, the Due Process Clause, the Equal Protection Clause, uh, you write so often about it that I wonder if you would share with us Thinking back on your time in law school, thinking back on the time that you first encountered the 14th Amendment as a constitutional concept, uh, did it strike you as one of the most important parts? Is that why you write so often about it? Tell us why this constitutional amendment, the 14th Amendment, is so important today. Well, the, the the reason we write about it often is the cases involved it very often. And when I was in law school, if we go back to that, Ernie Brown <laughs> knows this, and Mark the Wolf Howe and the others, the Constitution, as it then was, probably focused primarily on the Commerce Clause. And uh, it was before, it was just after Brown versus Board of Education. It was about a decade after, but not too much had happened yet. 
And uh, the reason I think it's so important now, what, well, one reason is it extended the protections of the bills of rights to the states. So the states couldn't take away your free speech and the states couldn't uh, treat you unfairly and so forth. And the other reason it has very basic principles. It has basic principles of treating people fairly. It has basic reasons in that due process clause that go all the way back to King John and the Magna Carta. The great thing about the Magna Carta, which the barons forced on King John, was it said due process of law, that means King John. You cannot just put people in prison because you'd like to do it. You have to follow the law too. And every one of us has that protection. And it's that very basic legal principle that really is the rule of law. Okay? One, you follow the law. Two, you don't like the law, you get together with other people and you get it changed through a democratic process. All that's in that document. And uh, right there, and of course, from a court's point of view, you can go back 2,000 years and read what some of the thinkers thought. Some of those thinkers said, how do we get people to live together in society? How do we get them to follow the leadership of a government? Well, they can make you through force, but really they can't. And courts can't have, they don't have force. That's what Hamilton said. They don't have the person, they don't have the sword. And we can't hand out money. And uh, there's a third way. Convince people that your decisions are fair and just. And then they might respect that leadership and then they'll follow it. Well, as I say, there are ups and downs. <laughs> but uh, I think uh, that probably is the best way and it may be the only way. And the 14th Amendment uh, helps get you right there with those words. Justice Breyer, I want to ask you about that third way in the 14th Amendment. It's, it's true, is it not, that even after making the decision uh, that people should be treated equally and fairly, many did not follow the court's decision. I'm thinking of Brown versus Board of Education. Many did not follow, and the court was unable to enforce immediately Brown versus Board of Education. How do we get people? What is that third way? How do we get people to do the things the court says are constitutional or to not do things that it says are unconstitutional, especially when those decisions might be unpopular. When Brown was decided, it was unpopular. How do we make that third way work? Yes, that's a good question. And I wish I had a good answer. I mean, go back to Brown. As I say, I finished college about five or six years after Brown. I uh, went to law school a few years after that. And you know how much integration there was in the South? Not much. Not much. Brown was 1954. You know what happened in 1955? Nothing. I mean, next to nothing. Catherine Lucy tried to go to the University of Alabama, and she was kicked out. 1956? Nothing. In 1957 was Little Rock. And that's when a judge down in Little Rock said, you better integrate this school, Central High School. And nine brave students, black, decided they would be the ones who went into Little Rock High School, white. And the governor sat in front of that door and he said no. And he had the police. And he said, you have a judge's order, but I have the state police. And there was a standoff and there was a lot of disagreement. And finally, the president of the United States Dwight Eisenhower, and I think this was a great thing that he did. Dwight Eisenhower called in the 101st Airborne, the heroes of Normandy, the heroes of the Battle of the Bulge. And they flew to Little Rock, and a thousand of them, and they took those children by the hand and walked into the school, but they couldn't stay forever. And Governor Faubus closed the school, closed it, and nobody was educated. Huh. The Supreme Court in Cooper v. Aaron, how the students read that one? That is one of my favorite opinions, because in Cooper v. Aaron, the court unanimously says, you go integrate that school. Stop stopping integration. Go do it. 
And that's when he closed the school. So he didn't do it. Uh-huh. But it couldn't last. It couldn't last. So what did it take? Martin Luther King, bus boycotts, the Freedom Riders, that was the period when the nation woke up. And so that's why I tell, I have told, the president of the court of Ghana, a woman who was trying to bring civil rights more to Ghana and protection. She said, how, why? It was the same question you had. I said, I can't tell you how you build that habit, but I do know this. It's not just up to judges and lawyers. Contrary to your popular belief, here and everybody's, we have 330 million people and 329 million are not lawyers and not judges. Those are the people you have to convince. Go to the villages, go to the towns, go to the cities. They're the ones, and by the way, it can't just be the lawyers, it can't just be the judges who try to convince them because they'll say, oh, well, they have a self-interest. No, it has to be a movement. It has to be history. It has to build a habit. You have to build a custom. And, and we have that custom. And it has to be a custom of following a lot of decisions you don't like. And really are wrong. I mean, somebody's wrong if it's five to four. So, big complicated answer, but it comes back to my first answer. Participate. Learn the document. Get out there and convince people you're right. And uh, then gradually you build a habit, a habit, a custom, which lasts a long time, we hope. And it is that custom that brings us to this day, which is called Law Day, which means a rule of law, which means, well, we have a chance, a chance at having a fairer society than when I grew up. Justice Breyer, can I ask you a somewhat less lofty question? Uh, there have been a number of recent requests for emergency relief at the court. Uh, this is apart from the death penalty cases, which you've had for, for years. Um, has the fact that the justices are not in the same building and not meeting together uh, had any impact on the decision-making process on those emergency requests? And is the court making any special plans for the election, which is in about 45 days from now, uh, to get to deal with these emergencies, which inevitably you're gonna have before the election and hopefully not after the election. Well, as to emergency matters, my first instinct is no, uh, it doesn't really matter that we're not physically together because with emergency matters that they come up and you have to decide them very quickly. And so one judge is in charge of each of the circuits say like the Fifth Circuit would be judge justice so-and-so, and, and all the emergency matters would go to that judge. And then the judge, if it's an important matter, will write a memorandum and ask it to be referred to the whole conference, which means the entire court. And then we'll read the memorandum. And there are the law clerks, and sometimes if it's a death case, for example, and sometimes even if it isn't, uh, the professional staff of the court will know what's coming along and trying to get those issues focused. And uh, so we'll read the memo, the clerks will talk to each other, and if necessary, I will get on the phone uh, and talk to the judge, and then we'll vote on that emergency measure. But you have to do it quickly. And so uh, uh, it's, uh, there's a, it's a very, un it's unusual that we grant them. I mean, usually we don't, because they'll work their way up in the normal course. And it's a, uh, uh, there have been more than usual with this COVID, but I don't think it's a, a special procedure. And I, I don't think that it's the, it's the nature of an emergency that makes it difficult. And it's not uh, one procedure rather than another. Well, of course, we, we know that there's going to be special things for the uh, election. I don't think we'll do something special. We don't, we don't know that cases will come to us. We've learned it's best, and I've learned over time, Deal with the case when it comes up. Don't deal with it on the basis of what's said in a newspaper. Oddly enough, not oddly, you will say, not odd at all. The briefs and the lawyers' papers and the opinions below tell us about the case. And um, time after time, I learned that the case is not the same as was reported in a single article. And I learned more about it from those documents 
difficult interim matter or difficult regular matter, even an interim matter. I'll get that. My And up being up here in Cambridge or in New Hampshire, my law clerks can get virtually anything to me in a day uh, with FedEx. And, and if it's necessary for me to read it in an hour, I can get into my office with a, a computer now and I can get into my office in in five minutes, and it's as if I'm in my desk uh, in Washington, and I just read the documents. I just did that last night. Dean Matthew. Justice Breyer, if I may turn your attention away from the law for a moment, you gave some intriguing advice on your uh, daily run recently in Cambridge. <laughs> and uh, some people asked you, uh, about this pandemic, about the coronavirus pandemic, and your suggestion was interesting to me. You said people should read the last few pages of Albert Camus' The Plague. So I went and did that, and I, I, I want to do that right now, just a, a, a little excerpt and ask you, what do you want us to take from that? Why is that your suggestion? So this is Dr. Ria in uh, Oran speaking and he says at the end, indeed, as he hastened to the cries of joy rising from the town, we remembered that such joy is always in peril. He knew that those jubilant crowds did not know, but could have learned from books, that the plague bacillus never dies or disappears for good, that it can lie dormant for years and years in furniture and linen chests, and it bides its time in bedrooms, cellars, trunks, and bookshelves, and that perhaps the day will come when, for the bane and for the enlightening of men, it would rouse up its rats again and send them forth to die in a happy city. Why is that so stirring and important to you? That speaks to my generation. I mean, this uh, coronavirus, uh, the quarantine is not necessarily pleasant. It's a hardship for a lot of people. And there are some virtues for us. To, I mean, you get more time with your grandchildren. You uh, see that uh, it's sort of fun and uh, to be with them. And uh, you learn more about cooking. And if you have several grandchildren and children and they're all up there with you, you learn that cooking is a good thing. And, a little more pesty than you think. And among other things, it does give you a little chance to read. Now, that was one particular passage that's always meant quite a lot to me. And uh, it shows you how times change in the, the plague. The plague is a book about how Oran, which is a city in Algeria, dealt with a plague. And I'd always thought well, it's really about the Nazis in France. And they were the plague. And there is that analogy. But it may not be the whole thing. It may be more really about a plague. And he's telling us several things at the end. And one of them is, uh, he says, why did you tell this story? They ask him. And he says, I told the story because I wanted to see, uh, to tell people how the people of Oran dealt with that plague. Some pretty well, some terribly. It depended. And he said, I also want to tell them about what a doctor does. Now, a doctor is a person who helps other people. He doesn't philosophize. He doesn't theorize. Uh, he doesn't talk about it. He just does it. There we are. Good. He's a help. And also, he said, and that is the final one, I want to tell them about this plague germ, because it never does die. It goes into remission. And what is that germ to me? It's been that part of human nature which isn't very desirable. And you can't get rid of it. And there it is, causing trouble. Sometimes minor trouble and sometimes major trouble. And that's what law is there about, to try to stop in large part. A rule of law is one, not the only one, but it is one of the weapons that human beings have in order to live together in society and to try to keep that plague germ under control. Yeah, that's right. 
And uh, so uh, that's uh, emotionally meant something to me. And maybe it's having actually been alive as a small child in World War II. And I remember those blackout curtains coming down in San Francisco. Alan was in the Navy afterwards. But we could have a little memory of that. I remember my relatives of mine who came from Latvia, who were over in San Francisco because of what was going on over there in Europe. And go look at some of those old movies. Uh-huh. We just got my grandchildren to see 30 Minutes Over Tokyo, where we bombed Tokyo because they were at war with us, and the Chinese saved those. They saved them, and a quarter of a million Chinese were killed in the effort to save Americans. I mean, the world was different, but it isn't different in one respect. That plague germ is there, not sometimes as virulent. Sometimes is awful, but it's there. Do you see all that Camus tells me personally and about the world? And and that's why that came to mind when he asked me what what would I recommend? I Justice Breyer, we're now gonna move we're, we're now gonna move to the student questions. Uh, we received more than six hundred questions uh, and we read no. every one of them. Uh, uh, and uh, we're not going to ask you all of them, but uh, we would love to have you uh, answer them. Uh, but all of them, but time compels us to uh, do our next best and, and to uh, uh, put a few before you, uh, which Dean Matthew and I will now address in turn. Dean Matthew, you want to start with the first one, please? Yes, I will. The first question, uh, Justice Breyer, young Americans are increasingly disillusioned with the concept or value of justice, let alone justice through the judicial system. What is something that you are doing yourself as a justice or personally to help rebuild confidence in the judicial system? Well, interestingly enough, I don't can't really say there's a single thing you can do. I said the main thing, people can participate. And of course, my job does help me participate in the life of the government and the democracy. But uh, I think, and, and this is the unanswered question, um, I think when you write an opinion, it has to be, particularly if it's on one of these subjects you were talking about that often falls under the 14th Amendment, it has to be comprehensible. And it has to be understandable to people who are not lawyers and who are not judges. If I don't always succeed at that, but you have to try. And you have to try to show why it's either in a mainstream or in a stream of law that has to do with justice eventually. Don't necessarily use those words. But law is an objective. Justice is an objective of law. Justice is one of the objects. Not every opinion can be just. But if it isn't, you better explain why. And you better explain why it will do to the law more harm than good. Now, our problem with that and a number of other things is people don't read the opinions. I mean, maybe a few law students do and the professors assign them. But that's a long way from the three, 200, what is it, 329 million people who aren't lawyers. And those who are interested, which is not everybody, We'll get their information from the press and commentators and so forth, and they love to say how political the court is. Well, that's a problem for us, and uh, because it isn't as political as they say. And politics, that's a long speech, but politics is not there. It's not politics, but law isn't computer science either. And what I learned at Lowell High School in San Francisco in the 50s and so forth does affect how I look at the world, the United States, and the law. To some degree, that's always true. So differences resolve over themselves around these big words and somewhat the law, of course, but not computer science and what you bring to them, and that isn't well communicated. It isn't because it isn't whether you're a Democrat or a Republican. It isn't whether you are a conservative, quote, or a liberal. That isn't the breakdown. That isn't the fault line. And it's hard to get that across. And the less it comes across, uh, the more people will think that we're junior league politicians. And then they'll end up with 
where I started. I say, I can't do too much, oddly enough. You, the questioner, you, the students, have to be the ones who understand the government. You have to be the ones who will participate. And that's going to be harder for you if I tell my grandchildren, hey, if you spend all day on the internet, you're not going to participate very much if you're all playing computer games. Okay, so uh, let's get away from all the games all the time. And uh, that participation, that understanding of our system, that being willing to work within it, compromising, cooperation, big words, but for the fifth grade at Grant School in San Francisco, they weren't just big words because we worked together in small groups and got one grade for five people. So people had to cooperate, okay? So it opens up a lot of questions now. And I wish I had a single answer. Uh, so it's corny, but uh, it's what uh, Thurgood Marshall said he hoped would be on his gravestone. And those are the words I did my best. That's all we can do. Try. Uh, a student, a student, a student that your opinions seem logical and analytical in the method of interpreting the Constitution, but also give strong focus to the real world consequences of your decisions. Has there ever been a circumstance or a case where you found that these two values uh, contradicted each other? Sure, lots of them. I mean, there are a whole lot of principles in law. I mean, what about stare decisis? What about following cases that were written that might not produce such good results now? Well, you don't follow them 100%. Sometimes you overrule a case. Where would we be if Brown had not overruled Plessy? But you do that too often, and the law loses its stability. People can't rely on it. They don't know what advice to give to their clients, the lawyers. And pretty soon you have a real mess as people try to plan for the future and they can't. So there are balances there and many is the time I followed cases that if I were deciding them anew, I might not decide that way. I might think, well, the results aren't so good here either. But other principles of law come in and drive me to that conclusion that uh, I wouldn't be happy with if it were the first time. How do you decide how much is too much in those circumstances? Ah, ah what a good question. Don't know. I mean, but, that's why a judge, you know, and uh, well, we'll never know. Nino Scalia and I used to debate this, and we had a great discussion in front of, I think, 2,000 students in Lubbock, Texas. And, and they came away, I think, those students thinking we liked each other, which we do and did. And they think that we disagree, but we agree on a lot of things. And he would say too much emphasis on consequences and purposes and so forth. You know, you're going to have a system that you are the only one who can work. Uh, nobody else can understand it. And besides that, uh, uh, you'll just do what you think is good. And that'll be terrible for law. I say, well, I don't, I don't think I do that. I don't think I do that. And he says, you may not. But believe me, anybody follows your system, they'll end up with that. And that'll be terrible for law. And I say, well, if you follow textualism all the time and you just read the text and think you can get everything out of text and history, I'll tell you, you're going to end up with a constitution nobody will want. Who's right? Neither of us really knows. That's the truthful answer. It's history. It's what will happen. It's what our children and grandchildren will do. It's what kind of world they will bring about that will answer that and a lot of other questions. Dean Matthew. One of my favorite conversations between you and Justice Scalia is one of my favorite cases to teach. And of course, it's District of Columbia versus Heller, in which you have a conversation just like the one you've described about what the right way to view the world and the right way to view the law is. And uh, it's playing out uh, for the rest of time, to be honest, Justice Breyer, uh, that conversation between the two of you. Uh, but my task, rather than to linger there, is to ask the next student's question, and it's about criminal justice reform. Justice Breyer, this student wants to know, what is the best way for America to move forward in genuine criminal justice reform, and how will you participate as a justice of the Supreme Court in that reform? 
And again, remember, we're, we're interpreting federal law in the Constitution, and that's a small part of the legal system of the United States. So you want to make a difference, criminal law or some other place, work in your own community, work in training police, work in training and getting things through courts, work in trying to see that uh, there are communities that understand what justice is and understand the problems that you cause other people when you don't follow the rules. And I mean, you know, all of that, local, statewide, don't think that the few cases that are in the Supreme Court uh, or in federal law are going to be the things that will really determine how you and your children and your families and everybody else live decent lives. And I sometimes say that one of the problems with something I worked on, the sentencing guidelines. Well, one of the problems, quite honestly, in my opinion, is those guidelines are, are too strict. I know that's not a popular thing to say, but what happened is they had very high sentences and then Congress got busy and raised the sentences. And they had something called mandatory minimum sentences, which means no matter what, you have to put somebody away for goodness knows how long, not just a lot of years and so forth. And who is it up to? Well, it's up to the courts. Oh, I see, it's up to the courts. Well, prosecutors. Prosecutors can go to a defendant and say, I'm gonna charge you with a higher crime with a higher penalty, or do you wanna plead guilty to this one? I say, my goodness, most of the pleas in federal court and state courts too are guilty. 90, 95%, 85%, 90% of the time, it's just a guilty plea. And all the judge is doing is uh, uh, deciding what the sentence was. And all those people are guilty. Oh, are they? I don't know. I hope so, but I'm not sure. So one, some, one of the things I sometimes suggest, and this brings us back to France, is that, uh, um, hey, in France, they consider a prosecutor a judge. He's called a juge de parquet. And you know where he learns how to be a prosecutor? At a judge's school. So why don't we send a few prosecutors to the judge's school so they can be judges? If they're going to decide, you know, what the sentence is and whatever's going to happen to all these people, maybe they should get involved in being trained uh, to do that kind of thing. I say that somewhat facetiously but not entirely. And uh, uh, my brother, who was a prosecutor for many years, uh, said, well, we only prosecute people who are guilty. I said, but now you're a defense lawyer and you told me that you have a few clients who aren't guilty. And he says, well, that's true. I said, how can that be? He said, well, we had better prosecutors then, <laughs> way back, you see? So it's a complicated system and it's a far from perfect system. And it's tried to say, but we can work on this system because uh, justice is where we want to end up on. And uh, the courts uh, can't do it perfectly. And But uh, uh, I rather like the system they had in England for quite a while. I think they do, where people prosecute some of the time and they defend some of the time. And that way they get uh, both points of view. So there, I think there are a lot of things, but. Uh, I mentioned a few, but I think it's an important job trying to improve. Thank you. I, have, I have the next question, uh, and this one may be a tough one for you. Uh, if your career on the court were to be judged by the public, not law professors, by one opinion, including dissents, which one would you pick out? I don't know. I haven't thought of that. I mean, I like different ones for different reasons. I, I mean, I, I, I was rather, I think, a difficult problem, but I thought the problem of affirmative action, I, I wrote a dissent in that that I spent a lot of time. I wrote a dissent that said I thought you'd read. Yeah. Yeah. See how it's going to Yeah. 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 And, the, and your uh, view there? My view is affirmative action, to a degree, uh, is permitted by the 14th Amendment. You know, that there's a difference between uh, trying to bring people into society who either through ancestors and so forth were tending to be excluded, which is what I think affirmative action when it works properly is trying to do, 
and excluding people from society, which was what segregation tried to do. And so we have a job, which is to try to people bring, bring people in. And that means people, I thought in that opinion, I said, good, local, localities, states, the feds, governments, who are, those who aren't in government, let them try something. That's my favorite saying of Franklin Roosevelt, try something, we have a problem try something. If that doesn't work, try something else. And if that doesn't work, we'll try something else again. So give them some leeway so they can try different things at dealing with problems that we have. Goes back to participation too, doesn't it? Okay. So uh, I thought, don't freeze out the possibility of affirmative action to some degree with a Supreme Court opinion that says never which is what I thought they were headed for in the majority, and I didn't agree with that. So that's, that, that was one. Dean Matthew. Justice Breyer, earlier you were speaking about how little politics has to do with the court's decisions. This student asks about something a little different. It's ideology, and I've heard you speak about it before, and so I... I hope this question gives you an opportunity to tell us the difference between ideology and politics. The questioner asks, the ideological division among the Supreme Court justices creates significant uncertainty for the American people, especially for decisions regarding civil rights. Do you think there is a solution to this? And if so, what's your vision for the court in this area? It's not politics and it's not ideology either. I mean, politics, I worked for Senator Kennedy for a few years and politics was, can I get the different, uh, the different uh, members of the Senate to our executive committee meetings? Uh, is this favorable to Republicans or to Democrats? Uh, how does this make the Senator popular or unpopular? All those are political considerations. Whose call do I take first? The call from the Secretary of Defense or the call from the mayor of Springfield? Of course, Springfield. But not, not, nonetheless, uh, uh, that's politics. Where are the votes? No, that's not on the court. Ideology is different. Ideology. Are you a um, uh, an Adam Smith free enterpriser or are you a... Uh, Marxist, Maoist troublemaker. I mean, you know, if I'm deciding something by ideology, I know I'm doing the wrong thing. I can't say that it never has an influence, but not often, and it shouldn't. Well, then what does? What does is these are big words in the Constitution, liberty, freedom of press, and so forth, and they don't define themselves. And how a person's brought up, what his background is, uh, all kinds of things, what he thinks the country's like, can sometimes have some influence in direction. And direction is not political direction. Direction tends to be, do you put more weight on text? Do you put more weight on purposes or values underlying those, those uh, uh, provisions of the Constitution? And do you look at consequences in light of those values? Do I pay attention to text? Of course. Every judge pays attention to text. Do others pay or call themselves textualists, pay attention to purposes and consequences? Of course. But the question is, to what degree? And what's the importance of the different things? There's text, there's history, there's tradition, there's precedent, there's values and purposes, and there are consequences. Those are elements or tools that judges use to interpret words in the text of the statute or the Constitution. All of those play a role. Some put more weight on the one, some put more weight on the other. And a person's individual background does make a difference there. It's not some theory. It's how you were brought up in part and what your career is like. And every one of the students out there, by the time he's 40 or 50 years old, will have views, very abstract, very general, about uh, the profession that they've lived in and how it works. What's the law about? You don't have to have an articulate answer to that. Your life and your, 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 your decisions will reveal your own answer, and maybe to yourself too. See, all that's involved. 
all that's involved. And if there are more differences now because there's textualism going around and so forth, will that create more problems? It might. It might. We don't know. But uh, the courts had lots of ups and downs. The courts decided some things that history shows were completely wrong. And it also shows some things were dissents. And I rather like this because uh, uh, Judge Bork said that once. He said, history sometimes showed that those dissents, those voices crying in the wilderness, were properly ignored. Is that? We don't know. But we'll do our best. And that's what we expect the students to do. That's what they think the lawyers will do. Try to get together. Try to compromise. Remember those joint projects. Remember working on the school board with other people. Remember working on the library committee of something or other. Remember working on some jobs creation agency. Remember working with other people. It involves cooperation and compromise. And the court is no exception. It's hard to bring about where you're working with law because law and for judges is a matter of principle often. But there's room. There's room. So we'll deal with that or try. I wish we had time for many more questions, but we do not. So I want to express our, our deep thanks to our honored guest, Justice Breyer, and to the outstanding students who submitted so many timely and thought-provoking questions. Uh, Dean Matthew and I are going to try to find a way to address more of them in a public setting before too long. And we're so pleased, uh, Justice Breyer, that you could join us only at GW Experience. A very happy Constitution Day to you all, and thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you.